It's time for another episode of The Sean Tabbitt Show, a podcast where I connect you with thought leaders from across the globe, digging into some of my favorite topics like personal development, marketing, spirituality, and pretty much any other shiny object that happens to catch my attention. Today, my special guest is Dr. Richard Gallagher, and we're going to be talking about his excellent book, Demonic Foes, My 25 Years as a Psychiatrist, Investigating Possessions, Diabolic Attacks, and the Paranormal. Richard, it is truly an honor, sir. Welcome to the show. Well, thank you. It's uh, nice to meet you. Well, I'd, I'd love to kick this off by having you share a bit of the Richard Gallagher origin story, so to speak. I know you're going to be brand new to like 99.5% of my audience. So for all of us meeting you for the first time today, what are a few things we should know about you? Well, uh, I was brought up in the New York area. In fact, uh, born in New York City as a Catholic and uh, grew up as a Catholic. And um, I went on to study uh, classics at Princeton and eventually psychiatry at Yale. Uh, and then uh, one day when I was uh, uh, on the faculty at Cornell Medical College, um, as a professor of psychiatry, uh, which is what I am, um, a, a very um, experienced, prominent exorcist came to my office and said, I'd like you to see a case. And, uh, you know, so none of this did I really volunteer for. I guess I feel in some ways it's more providential that way. But eventually I met a number of exorcists who used me as a consultant, a medical consultant. I also uh, was invited to join the International Association of Exorcists, which is a Vatican-approved uh, group of uh, world exorcists. I'm not an exorcist myself, but as a consultant and scientific advisor, I was asked to start do some writing in that. And then, you know, thanks for mentioning the book. More recently, I was delighted that Harper Collins published the book and also allowed me to kind of write the book I wanted to write. It's, it is chock full of stories, absolutely true stories, although, you know, as a doctor and, and for reasons of privacy, I, I protect the names of the people. But everything else is 100% is true about different cases. I tried to highlight a few of the more dramatic cases I've seen, but also give a, a kind of a theological and, um, um, you know, practical overview. I am, I am a professor at a seminary, as well as a professor of psychiatry at uh, two medical colleges. And in terms of uh, faith practice worldview, are, are you still a practicing Catholic, or where do you where are you at faith wise these days? So I'm a practicing Catholic, and I actually teach at a, teach at a Catholic seminary in New York. Okay. Um, one of, one of the things I want to pull on also from your backstory that you share in the book, and it seems like that was in kind of an introduction for you, maybe into more of the paranormal side of things. Uh, you share a story about your brother having, uh, I think it was warts on his hand, and he encounters this witch. And uh, that was a really intriguing part of the early part of your journey. Yeah, we both were living in, in France, and we actually played sort of semi-pro basketball. And uh, he had always had warts on his hand, and there was a, a neighbor woman who called herself a good witch. And, you know, through various incantations, she claimed to have cured him, and of course he was just happy that he didn't have the warts anymore. I don't, I don't think that was a sound thing for him to do, by the way. I don't think there are any good witches. But, you know, it alerted me to the fact that sometimes this sort of thing, you know, has some power. Uh, whether that power was a good power, uh, I still question. And in uh, terms of when you first got pulled into this work early on, um, was it Father, if I remember correctly, it's Father Jacques who mentored you, right? Well, again, not his real name. He was, he's, uh, there's a lot of people who know who he is. Uh, sure. He's just, uh, but uh, as with uh, everybody in the book, uh, I, uh, aside from a, a few prominent exorcists I mentioned, uh, I use pseudonyms. He came to my office one day and said, I have this woman who is, being bruised, she claims by invisible spirits. And I remember, uh, Mr. Tabbitt, what I said to him, I said, well, I'm a little skeptical of some of that stuff. And he said, you're skeptical, well, then you're the, you're the right man for the job. 
Uh, and I evaluated her and, you know, she gave, she and her husband gave a very coherent story that she would be lying in bed and she would be literally pummeled by invisible forces. And she, you know, uh, she was a good woman, but she was somehow being attacked by evil spirits. And so I said to the priest, look, I, I can't find any medical or psychiatric reasons for this. And he said, well, that's what I suspected, doctor. Uh, this is what we call an oppression. So she was not possessed, but this is what terminology differs a little bit. But, you know, uh, he was using the word of a, a lesser attack than a possession, which he called an oppression. And eventually I, I sort of came to believe her as I saw a lot more of these cases. I, I came to believe him as I saw a lot more of these cases. And one of the interesting things you bring out in the book is how somebody's uh, religious upbringing, again, kind of their their worldview, that lens they look through, how that impacts how they process. If they're experiencing something demonic, diabolical, but diabolical, unexplainable, even if you will, um, how have you seen through the years kind of their religious upbringing or worldview impacts how they process some of these things that are happening to them? Well, you know, contrary to a certain impression that uh, skeptics have, you know, these demonic attacks do not just occur in Christians. They occur in people through all, through all cultures, throughout all history. Uh, I mean, for the scholarly among your audience, there was a German professor named Professor Osterreich who did a history of this stuff from ancient times. He, he gives literally thousands of cases that were, and references that were possessed throughout history in all different sorts of cultures. Now, uh, you know, some of those people get delivered, um, although I also tell people there is no one in history. I'm a great lover of history. I studied classics at Princeton. There is no one in history who had the power over demons uh, as Jesus Christ. And, you know, it's a Catholic priest. Any good exorcist is still saying it's not me as an exorcist, as a human being who's delivering this person. It's the power of Jesus. And in terms of diagnosing a case, looking at indicators, like um, obviously that's probably something you developed more over time as you got deeper into this world and this type of uh, work. So what are some of the things you look for when somebody says, hey, Dr. Gallagher, I want you to come and evaluate somebody? Well, you know, I developed some of my own methods, but, you know, I'm really relying, uh, Mr. Tabbitt, on the traditional criteria. You know, again, uh, skeptics will say, well, this is all loosey-goosey stuff. People just intuit spirits. I don't intuit spirits. I, I, I make a, a very rigorous discernment. And in the Christian tradition, and maybe especially Catholic, um, you have to have very definite criteria before ultimately the, the bishop of the diocese who makes the final decision approves a, a exorcism, say, for somebody who is possessed. Now, what is that evidence? You have to see clear evidence of a foreign personality. Now, they may be speaking, they may be taking over the body in some way. Uh, you often look for, you don't always see it, but you, in many cases that I've worked with, you see definite suggestive criteria of a foreign personality. What am I talking about? Well, the person will have abnormally superhuman strength. They may be able to tell occult knowledge. You know, they may be able to reveal what in Latin is called latra, meaning they have knowledge of things that they would otherwise not know, this entity uh, manifesting itself. Uh, they may be able to speak foreign languages and understand foreign languages. And, uh, and you know, believe it or not, I've seen that many times. And sometimes the manifestations will be very, very flamboyant. You know, for instance, I've talked to quite a few cases of possession uh, where even though I didn't witness it myself, although I've been to a lot of exorcists and I've witnessed quite a lot, uh, but I've talked to about 37 people in my life who swear that they saw or experienced a levitation. And what I say to, again, what I say to skeptics, Mr. Tabbitt, is how many mentally ill people do you know who can speak Latin and levitate? I don't know too many. Not many. <laughs> uh, now, it is, it is helpful 
although good exorcists often, you know, can discern this stuff themselves. But it is helpful to have a psychiatrist or a doctor involved because I'm able to rule out people who are psychotic and just think demons are talking to them. Uh, people who maybe have multiple personality, people who are very, very suggestible or histrionic. I mean, it helps to rule out. It also helps to know something about the history. You know, is this a person that's gotten involved with the occult? Is this a person who has turned to evil in some powerful way? And you put the pieces together. You know, I never take one little sign or symptom as, as the be all and end all. Uh, but when you look at the total package, you know, most, most very experienced exorcists, let alone a doctor like myself, can clearly distinguish this between a medical or a psychiatric problem and a demonic attack. And in terms of uh, what I might term gateways to the demonic, I mean, are, are people often starting this journey because of trauma, witchcraft? Like, what are some of the common starting points for people that encounter this sort of diabolical activity? Well, there's no question that sometimes people who are a little troubled or something or, you know, use drugs or something, they, they make themselves a little more vulnerable. But it's, it's mainly they're more vulnerable, Mr. Tabbitt, not because they're traumatized or something. I mean, you know, there are tens of millions of people who are traumatized, and this doesn't normally happen to the average person. But it's because somehow they're a little warped in their thinking, and they've turned to something. This is the usual way. There are a few exceptions. But the usual way is these are people who have turned to either evil behavior you know, what Christians would call, you know, very, very sinful behavior, and or uh, occultism, the paranormal, witchcraft, that sort of thing. The vast majority of cases with very severe attacks, by that I mean possession, uh, have, that, have that history, with a few exceptions. Now, when you talk about lesser attacks, let's call it oppression, as I said before, you know, I mean, demons can attack even holy people because they dislike holy people. They dislike people who bring other people to Christ. And so, you know, they become the enemy too. One of the cases I found most fascinating that you share in the book was uh, a woman who had blocked senses. Anytime anything of, a, of God or a religious nature was mentioned, she couldn't hear any of it. Uh, I would just love to have you share uh, what was unique about that case? I'd never heard anything. I've read a lot of books in this space, and that that particular phenomenon was new to me. You know, it was a pretty dramatic uh, phenomenon. In other words, if you would say to her, uh, I think I call her uh, by the name Catherine in the book, again, not a real name, not her real state. Um, and if you asked her, if you'd say, Catherine, did you go to the store today? Now, she was possessed. But, you know, just because you're possessed doesn't mean you're, you know, you can't communicate in a normal way 24-7. So I would say to Catherine, did you go to the store this morning? And she said, yes. She heard me perfectly. Now, if you said to her, or if anybody said to her, Catherine, did you go to church or did you pray today? She said, I can't hear you. And this was the demon's attempt to make it hard to give her pastoral advice. So a psychiatric colleague of mine, we had this bright idea. Let's, instead of asking the questions, let's write out the questions. So we put it on a piece of paper, you know. Uh, Catherine, did you go to the gas station this morning? And she said, uh, yes, I needed gas for the, the pickup. Catherine, did you pray today? And I remember her looking at me with a, a sad face and said, Dr. Gallagher, <laughs> Why are you tricking me? There's nothing on that piece of paper. So what is the lesson? The lesson is that demons cannot truly uh, affect our will and our soul. What they can do is try to influence us, but they can, in these extreme situations, take over the body. And that includes, you know, certain messages to the brain that includes the senses and the imagination, you might say. So they can interfere, again, only with God's permission. And, you know, God doesn't cause this. 
It's like God doesn't cause cancer, but he allows certain evils to exist for his own purposes, you know, and uh, for the good, ultimately, as St. Paul said. And demons do have these strange abilities to cause all kinds of weird stuff, like diminishment of the senses in people that they that they are attacking. It's uh, it's pretty bizarre stuff, but uh, it's a strange world, right? Yeah, in, indeed, it, it is a strange world at times. And that seems like it really relates to people who are often oppressed or possessed having an aversion to things that are sacred. That was the first time I've heard of somebody not being able to read or hear things related to the sacred. But um, have you seen it often where somebody who's under a demonic influence um, is resistant or repelled by crucifixes or other kind of holy objects or relics? That, that seems to be pretty commonplace in reading about exorcisms. Absolutely. I remember dealing with a, uh, and, and then they lie about it, if the spirit at least. So for instance, one time I took a holy relic and I put it on this gentleman who was possessed and he grabbed the relic. It was, it was basically a metal and he threw it across the room, and I said, you didn't like that, huh? I don't normally talk to spirits, by the way, but, uh, you know, I, I was tempted to ask him. I said, you didn't like that. He goes, oh, no, 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 it was fine. So he clearly had this aversion to the sacred that many people under, under influence have, and yet at the same time, again, it's the spirit that has that aversion. It's not necessarily the person. And, and the spirit manifesting itself to varying degrees. But clearly, he had an aversion to this relic metal, but on the other hand, didn't want to admit it. And that, you know, brings us to another point, which is that demons constantly lie. They constantly lie. They, want, they don't want to admit who they are. And, uh, you know, throughout history, people have been possessed and pretending they're all sorts of things. They present that they're dead souls. They present that they're... And they lie. They just constantly lie. Now, it's a good sign in a Christian exorcism when they finally admit that they're an evil spirit, because they don't want to do that. And it's a good sign because what it proves is that they're losing their power to dominate and lie because they're forced uh, ultimately by Jesus, we believe, they're forced to tell the truth. And that's a good sign. It usually means that their um, control of the person is diminishing. Well, I, I think uh, the, the last story I want to pull on for our conversation, I believe you call her Julia in the book, and she was, uh, I think uh, you would term her as maybe a satanic queen or a bride of Satan. Tell us about some of the unique elements of uh, that experience of working with her. Uh, a lot of it sounds very memorable. Well, you know, I'm a pretty experienced psychiatrist. Uh, I tell people, by the way, I've evaluated about 27,000 people in, the, in my life as, as, a, as a professor of psychiatry. Now, people are surprised when I say none of those people, these are, these are patients, none of those people were possessed. So I, I think possession is rare. But I see a lot of cases, uh, Mr. Tabbitt, simply because people from all over the world, often clergy, contact me. This woman you're talking about, Julia, was the most dramatic case that I ever saw. Now, she was a Satanist. And, you know, I was aware as a psychiatrist, there was something called the Satanic Panic about 30 years ago, where, you know, everybody was saying, you know, Satanists are all over. They're in every neighborhood. They're kidnapping people. Somebody did, somebody figured out that there were more reports of Satanic kidnapping than there were kids who disappeared that year. So there was an exaggerated fear of Satanism. You know, C.S. Lewis used to say, don't become over preoccupied with spirits, although don't deny that they exist. It's, it's sound advice. Getting back to this woman, she was the real deal, though. She was this rare Satanist. And what was amazing is she was, she was, she called herself the queen of her cult, a very nasty group. And she called herself a high priestess. And what was also amazing is she was willing to talk to me. And she was even willing for me to talk about her openly as long as I didn't use her name. So this, this happened many, many years ago, um, but she was the real deal and she was possessed. So why would she come to me? Well, 
the priest said, you have to speak to him because, you know, they knew she was quite ambivalent. She never agreed to leave the cult, which, of course, is a contradiction in terms. You can't be delivered if you're continuing to be evil. People, people don't understand that exorcism is not magic. The person has to work at it. The person has to work on their spiritual life, and that goes hand in hand with the exorcism prayers. But this case was spectacular. I mean, you know, uh, I tell the, the quick story. Uh, the night before I met her, you know, these cats went berserk in my house. And, you know, my wife and I, I didn't, I didn't think too much of it. But, you know, and the next morning I met this woman and she said to me, how did you like the cats last night? So clearly, you know, she had, she had, had something to do it, presumably through the power of Satan. She worshiped Satan and she felt that he gave her uh, a lot of power and, you know, she could she could tell how she, she had all kinds of this hidden knowledge I talked about. She knew she knew how my mother died, but she knew how a lot of people died. She knew she could actually. One of the more interesting phenomena she had is she. Um, she claimed what the, the parapsychologists call remote viewing, that she could see people from a distance. And one day she told me that she was seeing the priest exorcist. And I, you know, I challenged her. I said, you know, tell me what he's wearing. Tell me what he's doing. She knew to a T, even though he wasn't doing, you know, his normal routine. And I called him and, you know, he said, oh, I guess you're talking to, uh, to Julia, right? Because, you know, he was doing exorcisms on her. During the exorcism, she spoke foreign languages. Um, she, you know, mightily struggled against the exorcist, which she had agreed could hold her down. Uh, but in, in addition, you know, about eight people, I didn't see it. I'm a busy guy. I don't go, I don't go to exorcist, you know, in, during the, normally, although I've been to quite a few in my life. But about eight or nine people swore to me that she levitated during the exorcism. That was a very dramatic case. Unfortunately, she never really turned to God, turned to our Lord, and so she was not delivered. When uh, two people that pop up in so many of the books that I've read in the past six months are Ed and Lorraine Warren. And I think you, you bumped into Lorraine at your, your mentor's funeral, if I remember correctly from the book. Just, I'm curious if you have any perspective on the influence that they had in this kind of paranormal exorcism discussion space. They, they were kind of pioneers in more in the paranormal side of the field. But I never met Ed. Uh, Lorraine was a gracious woman who... You know, she knew that uh, Father Jacques and I, as I call him, were, were friends. And so she was sympathetic to my losing a friend. Uh, she and her husband called themselves demonologists. Uh, I tell people that's a employment category that uh, previous uh, centuries didn't know. I mean, there are people who, who, who question whether everything she and her husband did was sound. I, I don't really know. I know that that, you know, Father Jacques sometimes would work with her and that, you know, they did come across some genuine cases, although I think a lot of the movies are ridiculously exaggerated and sensationalized. But, you know, I liked her as a person. She seemed a gracious. She, she actually died about a year ago. I, I don't know if you know that. Too. Yeah, yeah, not, not too long ago. Um, I guess the place I'd like to land here before we wrap up is just have you share a little bit about the work of the International Association of Exorcists. Um, what, what does that organization do? And like, why are they important in terms of the, the growing body of work around exorcism and deliverance? Well, it's not always in a completely sound way. A lot of people now feel they are being demonically attacked. Now, some of those people, and that's why I get pulled in, some of those people have mental illness or some other medical illness. It may be as people turn away from traditional religion and as occultism and paganism has a kind of a rise in our culture again, uh, it may be that there are more people, you know, attacked. And so, you know, the Catholic Church has felt that, you know, we have to deal with this in a sensible, rigorous way. And so about, you know, 30 years ago or so, I was invited towards the founding of this group which is based in Italy. And at this point, it's grown. There are 
several hundred exorcists who come. There are a few of us laymen and medical professionals who come and are invited. You have to be invited. I am now the longest standing American member, uh, in part because some of the original members like Father Jacques, you know, have died. Um, I've addressed them a, a few times about scientific issues. It's a wonderful organization that attempts to be not only collegial and allow exorcists from all over the world to, to meet each other and trade stories and practices, but also, you know, approach the topic from a very scholarly, rigorous viewpoint. And, uh, you know, it has been approved by the Vatican, and it's, it's uh, a, a group that meets every couple of years in Italy. And uh, in terms of additional books or resources you might recommend uh, beyond your own book, which, again, I, th I have thought was a phenomenal read, uh, any other books you would recommend for people who want to dive deeper into this space? If you want to approach it from a scholarly point of view, and, and, and this was written by a non-Christian who I think didn't fully understand the subject, one would read this ancient classic, uh, not ancient, but about 100 years ago, this, this German professor, Osterreich, O-E-S-T, Osterreich. Uh, now, he gives, he gives references throughout history, including in non-Christian religions and paganism. He gives thousands of references. Uh, I think you interviewed Father Rossetti once, right? Yes, mm -hmm. a few months ago. He is both a psychologist and an exorcist. And he wrote a book where he, he kind of talks about his diary. Uh, you know, there are a few things that I disagree with in the book, but not much. I mean, basically, it's a very sound overview of the field. And he's very, very experienced. And he also approaches it with both theological and psychological sophistication. So that's, I think, one of the more interesting recent books about the subject. And uh, in terms of whether it's our discussion today or when people uh, get to the end of the end of your book, like what's the takeaway? How do you hope you've challenged them, encouraged them? What would you like them to have learned? Like, what's the takeaway to your message? Well, you know, I'm not trying to scare people. I mean, I didn't go into this field uh, necessarily voluntarily myself, but, you know, I went into it just to help people. So in a way, there are a couple of audiences. One is people who might feel they're attacked can learn about, you know, how sometimes they may be mistaken about that or, you know, how they need to seek out help. Uh, there are many, many people in the field of deliverance and exorcism who wanted me to write such a book, too. And then to the educated public, it's really aimed at the educated public, you know, who wants to learn about, you know, a complex but important subject. You know, I always tell people, uh, Mr. Tabbitt, I'm sure you've heard of the term de demythologizers, you know, these individuals who try to act like, you know, Jesus' miracles and Jesus' driving out demons is all, you know, superstitions or anachronisms or something. Well, miracles still occur in the church, and demonic possession still occurs. And so it allows people, I believe, to understand the credibility of the New Testament literature. So it it kind of introduces some people who may be a little skeptical or on the fence to the realities of a dark realm that it is worthwhile spiritually for people to be aware of. Uh, again, I always quote C.S. Lewis, too. You know, we're not supposed to get preoccupied with that. We're not supposed to be fearful of that certainly not as good Christians. On the other hand, you know, to deny that reality to me flies in the face of massive, massive evidence. Now, we know human beings are pretty good at ignoring evidence, but the evidence is there, you know, uh, just as it is for the founding of Christianity, in, in my view, as a, as a professor at a seminar. Well, and uh, like we do with every episode, we'll make it easy. Uh, we'll have links to places where you can pick up Richard's book, Demonic Foes. We'll have links to the other resources we've mentioned as well throughout the broadcast. It's time to bring this episode of The Sean Tabbitt Show to a close. Many thanks for being a part of my conversation with Dr. Richard Gallagher. Once again, our book today was Demonic Foes, My 25 Years as a Psychiatrist, Investigating Possessions, Diabolic Attacks, and the Paranormal. And Richard, I just want to say thank you so much for sharing with us today. It's been an honor and a pleasure to have you on the show. 
Well, I appreciate the invitation. Uh, you know, people want to read the book, that's fine. I also take advantage of the uh, opportunity to a good Christian audience to say I can always use people's prayers too for my work.